we're going to discuss two ways that agriculture can address emissions of greenhouse gases. One is mitigation and the other is adaptation. Mitigation is used in a very broad sense in the rest of this video. It refers to actions taken to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that you emit or to um, adopting practices that capture or sequester carbon from the atmosphere. This is the area where generally most of the controversy occurs as people disagree on the need for mitigation, the urgency, and how you would go about persuading people to change habits in ways that reduce or capture greenhouse gases. Adaptation is a fairly practical way of considering this issue. This is basically risk management. A farmer, a rancher, or agribusiness owner needs to look at different scenarios, evaluate the likelihood of those scenarios occurring, and prepare for the most, most likely ones. No matter your political stance on the causes, the evidence of climate change is here. With the current political climate surrounding mitigation options being very contentious, more and more talk is about the need for adaptation to the changes predicted to come as a result of increased greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. How can things like temperature, the frequency of extreme weather events, hydrologic cycles and connections which would affect the availability of water, the timing of farm operations, or the presence of invasive species impact things like a crop rotation, your choice in crops or hybrids, how will it affect animal comfort? These two photos depict manure spills. The first is a stage demonstration to train manure applicators and cleanup procedures. The bottom photo shows a manure storage structure that failed on a farm and resulted in a spill that covered four to five acres. Let's create a example case study. In your state, regulations require manure storage is large enough to hold 180 days of manure production. Your state also requires that manure storage lagoons be inspected regularly, daily rainfall amounts are recorded, and a plan developed for what to do in case the structure fails or appears close to failure. In the past year, two farms in your state have experienced manure storage spills due to extreme rainfall events, which resulted in a great deal of negative publicity. The year before that, there were three similar examples. Climatologists predict that these extreme rainfall events are likely to continue. What are some ways that a livestock farm could manage this risk? One possible way is to build a larger manure storage structure than what is required by regulations. This is an extremely expensive proposition, but it is certainly one that should be on the table. Is a farm manager or operator willing to devote the time to careful inspections and actually rehearsing and updating their emergency plan rather than just going through the motions? If building an upgraded or larger structure is not possible, greater emphasis definitely needs to be put on the inspection and the emergency plan. Another option which is possible is that a farm completely changes their production system the one to one that requires less manure storage. Maybe you move from a confinement system to a pasture or grazing based system or partially move in that direction. Can you move cattle from an open feedlot to a barn that uses large amounts of bedding to completely absorb and contain all the manure solids without any liquid manure storage? Obviously these are expensive propositions as well and require operators to develop a whole new set of management skills. When you think about which of these options might be best for farms that you know in your area, also consider some of these. What if the farm is located upstream from a popular park? Does that change any of your answers? Would your answer to any of these questions be different for a new farm that has not yet built their manure storage versus an established farm that already has their structures in place? There's really no right or wrong answers. Every farm or ranch needs to evaluate their risks, their strengths, and their interests to find the best solutions. The next topic we'll move into is mitigation. There are many ways to mitigate or reduce agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions 
and on this slide they're listed very loosely in order of potential with the items near the top of the list having the potential for the greatest amount of mitigation and this is based on my best judgment after reviewing several information sources and certainly any ones of these that are next to each other could be shifted up or down based on information that you might read but as a general rule something that's at the top of the list is going to have more potential than the items towards the bottom of the list. You look at the top, soil carbon sequestration. Next is biofuel production, nitrogen use efficiency, covered manure storages, animal diets, and energy efficiency are the main things on this list. Agricultural practices collectively can make a significant contribution at low cost to increasing soil carbon sinks, to greenhouse gas emission reductions, and by contributing biomass feedstocks for energy use. This quote is from the 2007 report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it basically summarizes the review of worldwide scientific literature and the panel sing singled out soil carbon as the most promising method for agriculture to sequester carbon. Some ways that farms and ranches can sequester carbon in soils is through the use of conservation tillage or no-till, switching from annual to perennial crops, using cover crops, or applying organic materials such as manure or compost. Each of these requires different skills and could possibly involve buying different equipment or altering timing and decision, other decisions of farming operations. Biofuel production include ethanol fermented from corn or starchy grains. You'll also commonly find biodiesel made from soybeans and other crops. These are considered first generation biofuels and they are made from readily processed grains. When compared to fossil fuels, corn ethanol is estimated to result in 20% less greenhouse gas emissions, according to the U.S. Department of Energy. This number is expected to improve as manufacturing processes are more efficient. Pure biodiesel is estimated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75 percent compared to petroleum diesel and this is also from the U.S. Department of Energy. There's also rising interest in biofuels made from fibrous materials like switchgrass, forest products, or crop residues and these are typically referred to as second generation or advanced biofuels. These are estimated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 86% compared to fossil fuels, again according to the U.S. Department of Energy. Another advanced biofuel is oil made from algae. This process depends on algae using manure or other wastewater as a food source. The oil produced by the algae can be used to replace fossil fuels in different applications. At the time of this recording, second generation or advanced biofuels are being actively researched but are not at a commercial production scale yet. While biofuels do have a great deal of mitigation potential, it also has the potential to be too much of a good thing if it contributes to indirect emission increases through land use changes or if they displace other sources of renewable fuel instead of displacing fossil fuels. Nitrogen use efficiency is an important piece of the puzzle. On an earlier video in this module, you saw nitrous oxide emissions from agricultural soil management as one of the largest ag sources of greenhouse gases. In a perfect world, plants would use every ounce of nitrogen fertilizer that was applied to a field or pasture. In reality, it is impossible to exactly predict whether soil yields and other factors that go into the uptake of nitrogen by, by crops. Nutrient and manure management plans are an important step in improving nitrogen use efficiency. NMPs, or nutrient management plans, are basically a nutrient checkbook where you calculate the nutrient needs, usually focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus of the planned crop, and this gives you the total amount of nutrients that will be removed from that field in that given year. From that, you can subtract the nutrients that are already in the soil, um, calculated through soil tests and laboratory analysis. Any legume credits, if soybeans or alfalfa crops were there in the previous year. And any manure or compost applications that have been made. The amount left over tells a farmer how much inorganic or commercial fertilizer should be applied to the field. 
improving nitrogen use efficiency through reducing the amount of nitrogen fertilizer needed has an indirect benefit as well in that it reduces the greenhouse gas emissions generated during the production of these commercial fertilizers. There's also several other technologies, um, precision agriculture, variable rate technologies, nitrification inhibitors may also be ways that farmers can improve the nitrogen use efficiency. Covered manure storage captures gases from decomposing manure. The methane can be captured and burnt, reducing it to the less potent greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, or it could be collected in an anaerobic digestion system and used to generate electricity. Generating electricity results in additional greenhouse gas reductions if that re reduces or replaces electricity from fossil fuels. And after the manure or the waste have been digested, the resulting liquid still retains all of the original nutrients and can be applied to crops as a fertilizer. Ruminant animals such as cattle, sheep, goats emit methane as a byproduct of feed digestion. As a general rule, highly digestible feeds such as grains result in fewer direct methane emissions than less digestible feeds. A very small consideration in animal diets is nitrous oxide. You'll see it listed on the slide. Research has shown that carefully matching animal protein needs with the feed ingredients and not overfeeding protein can reduce nitrogen levels in manure, which will in turn reduce nitrous oxide emissions from manure storage or from land application of manure. But this is really a very small, small piece. Reducing fuel and electricity use on farms not only reduces greenhouse gas emissions, but should have a positive impact on the economic bottom line for a farm or ranch. This might be the lowest item on the list, but it's certainly one of the easiest and most cost-effective things to put into place. Switching to no-till or reduced tillage, insulating buildings, using energy-efficient light fixtures, utilizing natural light in buildings, or optimizing irrigation water use are some examples. When reducing greenhouse gas emissions, there are always some trade-offs. You might be able to reduce a direct emission, but you'll increase indirect in another area. That doesn't mean we should not try to reduce emissions. It just means that those making decisions need to consider the whole system and make choices that produce the best net reduction. There's no right or wrong answer on this slide. The point is to recognize that no solution is perfect and that there are some trade-offs that have to be compared. If feeding grain to ruminants results in less methane emissions, does that mean we should craft programs that encourage farmers to feed more grain and less forage? There's a lot of questions to consider here. One is that measuring direct emissions, especially methane, produced directly from the animal, it'll favor grain-based diets. Indirect emissions related to grain production and fossil fuel use and soil carbon sequestration tend to favor the forage diets. A conclusion that seems to be universal is that regardless of the production system, farmers and ranchers should strive for high efficiency, producing the most usable product in relation to the inputs that are consumed. Thank you for your attention.